Welcome to the Estrobalone, where your gut eats everything for breakfast. I don't know who came up with the name Estrobalone. It kind of sounds funny, but I guess it makes sense. Our microbiome plays such a pivotal role in how we metabolize estrogen, men and women, but specifically women, because obviously estrogen plays a bigger role. But on the contrary, men, it's very important that we metabolize more estrogen, right? It's very important that we excrete it. What we don't realize is that estrogen isn't just like this simple hormone. It's a very complex, okay? And we actually excrete estrogen. The liver can deal with estrogen. Okay, there's good estrogens, there's bad estrogens. The one estrogen that we really need to be cognizant of is called 1,7-hydroxyestradiol. That's the bad one, right? Point is, I'm not trying to demonize anything. The fact is, our liver will process estrogens. It will combine them with components to make estrogen water-soluble so that we can excrete it. Right? If we don't have the ability to excrete the estrogen, it circulates and it can still bind to a receptor. Estrogen doesn't just you know, once it binds to a receptor, like it's not over, right? Estrogen still gets manufactured and produced within the body. And if it's circulating, it can bind to a receptor. And sometimes that happens in too much abundance. Well, it turns out that our gut plays a really big role. You see certain bacteria within our gut and this, what's called the estrobolome. Okay. It plays a role in producing an enzyme called beta glucurinidase. This beta glucurinidase basically breaks down estrogen and allows it to be able to be absorbed, okay? Now, what happens is that estrogen that is absorbed can go back through, bind to a receptor, or it can go to the liver and get uh, turned into being water-soluble and excreted. So you can see how the bacteria within our gut can dictate and mediate how much estrogen is excreted versus what is reabsorbed. So it turns out that right now, about only 10 to 15% of the estrogen that we have in our bodies is getting excreted meaning a significant amount is getting reabsorbed. Probably too much, right? Because we have to factor in environmental factors. How much estrogen are we taking in from the environment? From BPAs, from plastics, from all kinds of things. So if we have estrogen coming in and we don't have enough of an ability to deal with it, it is throwing off our natural patterns, right? Again, totally normal to have estrogen. Estrogen is not bad, but when we have so much of it, and we're not able to process it, the combination of external environmental factors with a lot of estrogen in conjunction with insufficient microbiomes and a lack of diversity can be a big deal. Diversity does matter, so soluble fibers do matter, chia, flax, things like that. Uh, I'm not gonna say that this solves everything by any stretch of imagination. I'm very careful not to say that, but people ask my opinion on probiotics. I do think that probiotics have a place. I do think that they're, they're not a fix-all. They don't fix everything. But I think that in a world where we are lacking some diversity, they probably have a solid benefit. But I recommend one that's down below. I put a link for it. It's called Seed. They are a supporter and a sponsor on this channel. So, you know, full disclaimer, but they are also the one that I use. They have what's called a daily symbiotic. So it's a capsule inside of a capsule. Okay, so it ends up having a nice selection of bacteria, a nice selection of strains, but also has prebiotics along with it because prebiotics feed the bacteria. So the symbiotic relationship between prebiotics and probiotics is very important. So seed with that capsule inside of a capsule, just a really interesting delivery technology. So again, they're a supporter of this channel and because of that, there is a 15% off discount link that's down below in the description. So that way you can check out seed for yourself. Check out some of the research they're conducting and some of the stuff they're doing. Uh, their founders are putting a lot of money into microbiome research, which is cool. So that link again is down below, saves 15% off that daily symbiotic. The way we have to look at diversity is like this. Okay, we don't really know what specific strains of bacteria do. We know certain things, but you know, we might know, okay, one bacteria has you know, inflammation modulating properties. One bacteria has uh, glucose modulation properties when it comes down to the short chain fatty acids that are produced. We know like individual isolated things, but that doesn't mean that we know everything. So what you have to know about the microbiome is, is this thing called cross feeding. Okay, this is where it just compounds and it becomes almost mind blowing. You look at, okay, if you have bacteria, these bacteria might produce certain compounds or certain waste. We call it waste, but maybe it's totally useful. Well, then there's other bacteria that can feed on that waste. It's called cross feeding. And then those bacteria flourish and create more cross feeders. So then, and they have different properties. And each bacteria has its own set of roles because we are what is called a symbiotic relationship. We are a host 
but we get a benefit from their metabolism, from them, their metabolization of different things. We get a benefit from that and they get a benefit because they get a place to live. We don't really communicate with each other. They are there doing their job. They don't care about us. We should care about them because we're the host. In every sense of the word, we're the host, right? But diversity is allowing us to have more flexibility in the direction that things go. So it's like you have just a bunch of different things to choose from. I mean, I guess the simplest analogy is it's like if you have a lot of money, you have options. You can do this, you can do that. If you don't have a lot of money, you're pretty set in a structure that you can't really move away from. You don't have options. If you have diversity in your gut, you have options for your gut to flourish in a specific way that's gonna benefit them, but also may have a direct effect on you. So if we have a wider diversity of gut bacteria that are specifically in this estrobolome, we have the ability to be flexible and quick to react to estrogenic changes, meaning the 1,7-hydroxyestradiol that might come in from BPAs or the estrogens that we're getting from all kinds of different things, right? From even lavender. There's even evidence that lavender could, it's wild world out there with estrogens. But also for women that are going through perimenopause that might have these big spikes in estrogen and there's going to be estrogenic waste and that needs to get dealt with. So having that diversity in your gut is super important. I'll give you a few things that I would recommend that you consume just in terms of gut diversity, okay? So for one, obviously things like artichoke, things like asparagus that are super high in very long chain inulin. Inulin is a great fiber that's going to allow those bacteria to flourish, okay? Also things like chard are gonna be good as well, a little bit lower fiber content. Beta-glucans, things like seaweed, nori, mushrooms, okay? Beta-glucans are a very unique kind of fiber because they break down in a different way because there's like 250,000 glucose molecules that we can't break down that our gut can break down and ultimately release a lot of fuel for our gut. So that's a very important piece. Additionally, when you look at other kinds of fibers that you can have, okay, different kinds of mushrooms are going to have other kinds of fibers as well, like chelin, okay, that's gonna be a common mushroom fiber. Uh, so try to get those kinds of things in as much as you can. Soluble fibers like chia and flax. The caveat with flax is that there's some studies that demonstrate that flax is estrogenic. So right then and there, you kind of cut yourself into this corner. But if the flax is estrogenic and you have the ability to process and excrete the estrogen you don't need, then it doesn't really matter as much. I think the fiber is going to win in the war of that if you really look at the big equation. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight as to how this works and how if you're dealing with puffiness, if you're dealing with water retention, if you're dealing with estrogenic issues, then perhaps looking into your microbiome and your fiber intake is something that you should consider. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.